History as it happens, February 6, 2024. Historians versus Trump. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. What was the president asking you to do? He was asking us to recalibrate or recalculate, I believe it was, recalculate. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify. But it's trying to get compliance if this is now effectively a riot. 49 hours declaring it a riot. They failed to attempt to obstruct the Congress. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment reads, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state, who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Well, the Supreme Court is about to hear arguments about whether this applies to Donald J. Trump. One of the great historians in the world today argues, yes, it does. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Mostly, I should say, by, by conservative scholars. I mean, we're talking about Federalist Society people. These, these are real originalists. And they come to the conclusion that, in fact, the 14th Amendment disqualifies Trump automatically. Done. There really shouldn't be a question of that. To say that that should be undone, to say that the law shouldn't, that we should turn to politics rather than to law, well, the law is there. After he egged on a riot to attack Congress on January 6, 2021, trashing the peaceful transfer of power in a desperate stab at stealing an election he had lost, Donald Trump had disqualified himself from ever seeking office again. At least that's what I assumed, but not legally speaking. I'm pretty sure the 14th Amendment never crossed my mind that day. We have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol! To the upper level! They're requesting additional resources on the east side as they broke into that window. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. Those who choose to continue to support his dangerous gambit by objecting to the results of a legitimate democratic election will forever be seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack against our democracy. I just assumed that Trump had finally gone too far. His party and his supporters would abandon him, especially after he showed no contrition and to this day continues to say he won the 2020 election. I mean, here are his unhinged responses to Caitlin Collins in that infamous CNN town hall last year. Can you publicly acknowledge that you did lose the 2020 election? Let me, let me just go on. If you look at True the Vote, they found millions of votes on camera, on government cameras, where uh, they were stuffing ballot boxes. What you just said there, Republican officials debunked those claims about fraudulent ballots. We want to give you a Who? chance tonight. Who? Republican officials Who? in Georgia and every single state. Uh, there is no your own election officials, Mr. Look, President. Uh, so we wanted to give you a chance. People were afraid to take on the issue. All you have to do is take a look at government cameras. You'll see them. People going to 28 different voting booths to vote to put in seven ballots apiece. But I mean, Mr. President, and they're all I have on to camera. stop you there because because there is no evidence of that. Your own election officials testified to that and have said that Republicans in these states. Did this in Georgia, there were multiple recounts, including a hand recount. Well, I was wrong about the consequences. Donald Trump will soon win the Republican nomination and has, according to polls today, a decent shot of returning to the White House. Unless, unless the Supreme Court rules he's disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. 
In an essay for the New York Review of Books, Princeton's Sean Wilentz writes, Over the past 40 years, the doctrine of originalism, along with its sibling, textualism, has been the cornerstone of the jurisprudence of the conservative majority that now dominates the court. Concocted in the 1980s to roll back the constitutional precedents of the New Deal and Great Society eras, supposedly in the name of judicial restraint, originalism purports to divine the original intentions of the framers by presenting tendentious renderings of the past as a kind of script. Well, Lentz goes on to say this bad faith invocation of the framers has become a ploy to justify overturning Roe v. Wade, gunning the Voting Rights Act of 1965, eliminating common sense gun regulation and more. But now this originalist petard is exploding in the majority's face. No degree of cherry picking or obfuscation can deny the historical record of the 14th Amendment, which is unequivocal, Will Lentz writes. If Donald Trump engaged in any way in the insurrection of January 6, he is automatically barred from holding any public office, federal or state. I'll share a link to Professor Wilentz's essay on the page where you can listen to this podcast at WashingtonTimes.com. I'll also share it in my weekly newsletter. You can sign up for that at HistoryAsItHappens.com. I'll also share the two amicus or amicus briefs filed with the Supreme Court by distinguished historians who make clear the meaning of the 14th Amendment. The office of the presidency is covered by Section 3. One need not be formally charged or convicted of insurrection to be disqualified from holding office. One need not have engaged in any violent behavior. Simply supporting or planning an insurrection is disqualifying. And Section 3 applies for all time, not only the Confederates of the 1860s. And it is self-executing. It does not require a court case. But a case we will get on February 8th, and at some point after that, the Supreme Court will let the world know where it stands and what will be one of the most consequential rulings in American history, whether it disqualifies Trump or saves him. Adding to the sense of urgency on the part of Trump's opponents is what Trump has said he'll do upon returning to the White House, rounding up people who are in the country illegally and holding them in camps so they can await deportation. His threat to use the Justice Department to take revenge on his foes is another example. But while Section 3 is clear, there is still some disagreement over what constitutes an insurrection, or really whether Donald Trump took part in an insurrection or something less grave. I mean, when is a riot an insurrection or a coup d'etat? Does it have to be a full-scale rebellion as in 1860-61? Does it matter that what happened on January 6 basically had no chance at stopping the certification of the election? Or does intent merely matter here? Sean Wilentz is, as you know, my favorite American historian, so it's an honor to have him back on the show. He is the author of The Rise of American Democracy. The Age of Reagan, and No Property in Man, among many superb books, all of which I have read except for his book about Bob Dylan, as I like to remind him. Sean Wilentz, welcome back. Great to be here, Martin. You were just down here in D.C., one of a handful of historians who were invited to speak with President Joseph R. Biden at the White House. You're not allowed to discuss the details of that conversation, but I think it's going to be about what we're going to discuss here. Democracy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The the pres- I, this is the second time I've I've had a chance to speak with the president at the White House about this stuff. You know, he wants historical perspectives on the situation we're in now, and that's what you know we historians ha- have to give him. And and then he gave a speech right afterwards, which is I'm not so sure it was the first time. I think the speech actually kind of grew in part grew out of that conversation. I think here the speechwriters knew better what they were going to do, but they had us in anyway. I don't know. I I don't know about you, but I mean I'm gonna when I step into the Oval Office, I think wow. I mean I'm still enough of a you know, school kid to yes. think that that's really cool. And we got to spend some time with him there, and it was great. Well, that's yeah. quite an honor. I saw that Annette Gordon-Reed was also there. I enjoy her her books as yep. well. And Heather was there, Heather Cox Richardson, who is probably the most influential historian in America right now, aside from the right-wing crazies. <laughs> uh, and uh, and Eddie Gloud and uh, Beverly Gage. It was, a, it, was, it was quite a nice crew. And John Meacham, of course, too. Yeah. Beverly Gage just won the Pulitzer Prize, right, for her book about J. Edgar Hoover. Indeed. That's right. She did indeed, yeah. yeah. Well, I've been wanting to have you on the show I even had a title ready for the podcast episode, How to Think About American Democracy. Although I have not been invited to the Oval Office to discuss democracy with the president, I think I have a pretty good idea that the origins of our problems 
cannot be understood by rummaging around 1920s, 1930s Europe, uh, Mussolini and Hitler. So now you write this essay in the New York Review of Books where you're getting to what I think is the more relevant subject matter. The Confederacy, the 1860s, uh, anti-democratic forces in our own history. Why don't we start there? Uh, The origins of the 14th Amendment, as you point out in your essay, this was about consolidating a social revolution to abolish slavery. Yeah, I mean, the amendments rewrote the the Constitution, in effect, because slavery was tolerated by the framers in 1787. And to really get rid of slavery, you had to to, to amend the Constitution. And then not just amend it in in terms of abolishing slavery nationwide, which, which the 13th Amendment did, but also to consolidate abolition politically by doing what they could to enfranchise black men at that point, and that would change with the 19th Amendment, but to enfranchise, give political power, but also to prevent um, the Confederate, uh, what should we say, counter-revolution from taking hold and barring from office, for example, as in the 14th Amendment, barring from office anyone who had taken an oath to support the Constitution who then violated that oath by supporting the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's what it was. It was a revolutionary moment. Um, and it was an extended revolutionary moment because slavery was that important to, uh, you know, the structure of American society and politics. So, Sean, what do the following have in common or what did they have in common? Because they're all dead. Uh, Kenneth Worthy, county sheriff. William W. Tate, county attorney. You like my accent? I don't even know. Is that an accent? J.D. I have no idea. What, I, know, I don't know none of these people. So you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> J.D. Watkins, district attorney. Zebulon. Ah, yes. Okay. Now I know what you're saying. <laughs> Zebulon B. Vance. Uh, he was a congressman. And, uh, well, Vance, Vance got back in because Vance, yeah. the amnesty that President Johnson put in. But go ahead. Yeah, and A.F. Gregory. These are former insurrectionists, Confederates, who were uh, barred from uh, seeking office again under Section right. 3 of the 14th Amendment through right. adjudications. These were court cases. And there were only a handful of these. That's because Mm -hmm. there was just an assumption, a correct assumption, that the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, really the entire amendment, was self-executing. That anyone who Mm -hmm. was in the Confederacy, and that was many, many people who held office, swore an oath, Mm -hmm. and they violated their oath, could not return to elected office again. Correct, correct. And, uh, you know, very few, you know, former Confederates thought that it was, that they even wanted to serve in the American government because the American government just defeated them. And they were, you know, following the lost cause rather than making their way back in. So, yes, but what you say, Martin, is right. I mean, people assumed that the 14th Amendment was there, so they weren't going to even bother to run. But there's a more recent example, actually, from 2022 in New Mexico. His name is Griffin, actually, Mr. Griffin, who was the head of Cowboys for Trump, who was a county commissioner in New Mexico, was was removed under the 14th Amendment just a couple of years ago. He'd already been convicted of trespass, and I, he was fined, I think. He was convicted of something, but not of insurrection. So he he was removed from office by, as you say, by a local district judge. Nothing was required from the Congress to do that. Hey, I'm getting that list, by the way, from Crew Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Uh, you can find this at citizensforethics.org. Only eight officials have been formally ruled to be disqualified under Section 3. Thousands more were understood to be disqualified in the period between the ratification of the 14th Amendment, 1868, and then the Amnesty Act of 1872, four years later. The point here is that it involves, and we're going to get to all these different points that have been raised, that the 14th right. Amendment does cover the presidency. Where did this wacky idea come from that the presidency is not in, included in this? Uh, recently, like two months ago, as far as I can tell. I mean, everybody assumed the presidency was there. If you look at the debates in the Senate, one senator, actually, Reverend e. Johnson, says, I don't think the presidency is covered here. And uh, he is quickly corrected on that. And he says, yes, it is. And so you couldn't get more explicit that the people who were framing the amendment and the people who were supporting the, that section of the amendment believed that the presidency was covered. The presidency is not actually named specifically, in part, I suspect, because I couldn't imagine that that, that was going to be a problem. Um, they were more interested in Congress and so forth. But they do say quite explicitly, you know, uh, officers under the United States, you have to believe that the one federal officer, <laughs> the one federal officer who's not a really an officer is the president. I mean, this is, as I say in the piece, this doesn't doesn't pass the smell test. But I, I don't know that anybody's, well, the issue hasn't come up. You know, yeah. there hasn't been an insurrection like this at, ever in American history, except, you know, the Confederacy. We don't face this kind of challenge 
to the Republic very often, thank God, but we face it now. And that's that's what's important to understand is that we are facing it now. Yeah, you're trying to say in your essay that uh, these debates about whether it's the right way to go, whether this should just be done politically, right? Vote Trump out are missing right. the point. Look, this is the United States of America, right? We have a constitution. The constitution is is clear on this. And on this point, it's absolutely clear. People should have realized this back in on January 6th, the, the aftermath. The, the one person who did that I've noted is was the historian, Eric Foner who made this point then. He said, look, this guy's just started and involved in an insurrection. He should not be allowed to run for president again, regardless of impeachment, regardless of any of that. Well, Eric was right, but it took the, it took the rest of the world three years to catch up to it. Not, that's not exactly true. It, it sort of opened up more research into the 40th Amendment and to the question of self-execution and so forth. And, and some very interesting scholars, I, I mentioned them in the piece, that you're referring to very nicely, Martin, who went in and really dug in. And, and, and there were some exceptions and there were some wrinkles in it, and they, they examined them very closely. So it really took uh, the insurrection to actually bring people back into studying it. But the studies that have gone into it, mostly, I should say, by, by conservative scholars. I mean, we're talking about Federalist Society people. These, these are real originalists. And they come to the conclusion that, in fact, the 14th Amendment disqualifies Trump automatically. Done. There really shouldn't be a question about it. To say that that should be undone, to say that the law shouldn't, that we should turn to politics rather than to law, well, the law is there. Um, it's to say, in effect, if you talk about the dangers that are posed to democracy, people sometimes say, well, if they disqualify Trump, we're going to alienate these millions of people who will say that democracy was undone, that it was all the deep state, that all this terrible stuff. Well, that's not as big a danger to the future of democracy as the, as the candidacy of Donald Trump. The candidacy of Donald Trump is a clear and present danger to democracy. It was precisely what the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind. They are as implacable, the Trumpists, as the Confederates were, the ex-Confederates were. They will stop at nothing. They have said so. I mean, I'm not, we're not making this up. Most recently, you know, Representative Stefanik said that she would not necessarily respect the outcome of the vote in November. This is a, an announcement of what, what they plan to do. There are many other instances which we can talk about. This is perfectly clear. And they're saying they would do it again. Why is that less of a threat to democracy than enforcing the actual Constitution of the United yeah. States? To well, me, it's wacky. Some folks are arguing that Trump and his minions simply wouldn't be able to get away with what they're going to try to do. Whatever that might be. What do you mean? Well, because well, 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 there's institutional not? guardrails and, you know, that. Oh, give me a break. Look, yeah. read and see what, what Trump has in mind if he gets elected. Quite apart from the fact that if he doesn't, right? I mean, you know, we might be able to stop him then, but at, but at what cost? But the fact is, if you read what he has said he will do if he gets reelected, which is why the, the danger of democracy is so present, it's frightening. It's frightening what he's talking about doing. I mean, read the fine print. I recommend to your listeners um, the Heritage Foundation Project 2025 report and what's in there. It's a kind of – the Heritage Foundation actually did this for Reagan, as I recall, back in 1980, 81, uh, giving them a, a guidebook to what, what you could do as president to bring about what you wanted to bring about. It's scary. I mean, what they're planning to do is basically to eviscerate the federal government as we know it, to replace it with Trump's flunkies uh, from top to bottom. And to make basically the, the federal government into an instrument of one man, the charismatic despot, Donald Trump. And he can do that, by the way. He can do it. There's no guardrail that's going to stop it. They, they figured it out. You know, they, they didn't, hadn't figured it out, you know, back in 2017, 2018. They, they, they were new to the game. Now they figured it out. Um, and people, not just the Heritage Foundation, but if you take people like Stephen Miller and others, they know what they're, they're about. They're not stupid. People you think that Trump, who knows very little about government, but knows a lot about being a despot, but there are people around him who figure this out. The guardrails will not be there if he is reelected. The guardrails might not even be there if he's not reelected. That's the point. And that's why the 14th Amendment is so important here. Why do people assume that because it worked in the past, it's going to work again? I mean, we came perilously close in on January 6th, 2021 to a coup. And that coup has not stopped. So, you know, I don't I don't know why people are so just so confident. I think people are confident because they're complacent and complacency is exactly what leads to disaster.
So I have the Heritage Foundation's website up here, and I'm trying to find that fine print. I'll I can send I can yeah. send it to you. I can no, send yeah. you the you know well, I'll give you the. Well, what the, I think the the they're link. getting at here is to hollow out democracy, not to end mm-hmm. democracy as we know it. Well, <laughs> democracy as we know it will disappear, but but democracy as we know it is, is there's another word for democracy as we know it, and that's called democracy. You don't have these things. This is not This is not what the framers yeah. of the Constitution had in mind. The reason I'm bringing this up, though, is because of all the warnings you hear from, you know, dire warnings about the fate of American democracy. It's not that we're going to stop having elections or... How do you know? Yeah. How do you know? How do you know that, Mark? Why are you so, so complacent about this? We don't know that. Now, look, will we? May Probably. Probably we will. But that doesn't mean that the government will not be fundamentally transformed. But I would take nothing for granted. I don't know why people do. Well, I do agree with you that Donald Trump wants to use the executive branch as a tool to go after his enemies. I mean, he's made that clear. But around that are institutional changes that are much bigger than just simply going after, I don't know, Mark Milley or something. Um, Although the rhetoric that's coming out of him around, (laughs) around Milley is so chilling. I mean, he's talked about, you know, executing him, giving him the death penalty. Now, People think that Donald Trump is is mere shtick, right? They always think, you know, he's a showman, and he is a showman, and they never quite take seriously what he's saying. He won't really, he doesn't really mean that. He means it. He means it. Every single word. With every despot, by the way, this this is an historical pattern. You don't have to go back to the 20s and 30s. You know, the Confederates were saying what they were going to do. And every, many people said, no, they won't go that far. They won't actually succeed. That's great. Well, they did it. They did it. Yeah. And, and that's true for every, for every tin pot despot you've ever heard of. Even today, many leftists do it too. I mean, they, they will say, well, I'm going to do this. They say, nah, he's just kidding. No, they do it. They try to do it. So I would, take, I would take Trump at his word, actually. In a sense, what he plans to do, whether he can pull off talking about Donald Trump, the worst of his ideas is irrelevant in your view and the view of others. He engaged in insurrection. Therefore, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what he wants to do in the future. You're disqualified. Well, yeah. that's true. I, you're right. And it's a constitutional matter. What he's promising is not relevant. However, it is relevant to the extent that if you want to measure, because people are measuring the uh, fate of democracy out of all of this, the arguments that are being made that, you know, this will do more damage to democracy than Trump could possibly make or that Trump's candidacy will. There you do look to the future. It is a clear and present danger. And it does connect in the sense that, you know, it is similar to what the ex-Confederates were doing in 1866, 67, 68. That's where it becomes relevant. But you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of the actual disqualification, Basically, he he is already disqualified, Mark. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's not something that we have to argue over. He's disqualified, and, and the Colorado Supreme Court has said so, and that's it. If the, the Supreme Court was to rule otherwise, then it will have shredded its own basic principles of originalist jurisprudence. Let's return to the originalism argument that you're making. You turn that against the people who embrace it in your essay. You know, if they want to really be originalists in your view, then it's time to... Uh back that up, right? Who knows? I I can't tell you what Clarence Thomas and uh, the others on the court are going to do yet. Uh, This episode will be running prior to the oral arguments on February 8th. We're doing a preview, I guess you can say. But, you know, the thing is about Trump, I guess part of me is I don't like to sound like an alarmist. We had a lot of that in 2016, 2017. I'm more worried about the chaos of a Trump administration rather than, you know, like I said, ending democracy or, you know, not having any more elections. Although what you say the Heritage Foundation has in store and the things you've been discussing, you know, is pretty bad. It is anti-liberal. It's anti-democratic. It's Mm anti-openness. It's a rejection Mm -hmm. of international cooperation. Goodbye to NATO. Goodbye to Ukraine. And being done not as a matter of policy, but as a matter of institutionalization. It will change the entire world. It's a blueprint for handing the entire world over to China and Russia and the United States. It's it's a triad of despotisms. That's what it is. And and just in the foreign policy piece. And that's something else that the executive has a lot of power over. So this isn't just a national question, it seems to me. This is a a global question that we're dealing with. I mean, it's really really big. But, you know, sure, sure. I mean, a a Trump re-election does mean that then this is not a matter of constitutional law. It's just a matter of policy. Kiev will become, uh, forget it. I mean, Ukraine will be undone. It's going to be part of Russia all the way to Kiev. That's going to happen if if Donald Trump is re-elected. And watch what's happening, by the way. This is another point, actually. 
and and I don't know if you want to get onto this, Martin, but it has to do with the um, legitimacy of the Republican Party at the moment. Because yeah, sure. in my view, in my view, the Republican Party died in 2016, and it was replaced by another party. And it's taken time for people to get their heads around that. You know, as an historian, I mean, we know, and, and everybody knows, but certainly historians know that in American history, political parties come and political parties go. There was a thing called the Federalist Party, which was running the country at the founding, at the you know, in the first Congress. It disappeared within 30, 40 years of that. The Whig Party disappeared. There's nothing sacrosanct about parties. Well, the Republican Party died in 2016, in my view, and was supplanted by this other thing. People call it a cult. People call it whatever they want. I call it the MAGA Party. And it is top to bottom what exactly the Republican Party once was. And by the way, the people who feel this most acutely are Republicans like, like Liz Cheney, who is basically saying exactly what I'm saying now, that they're going to have to start all over again, that the Republican Party is dead insofar as it's given any credence by people like Mitch McConnell, which is shocking to me to watch what he's doing, to say as if, well, they're, they're Republicans and therefore Trump. They are irrelevant. They are kowtowing. I don't know what they're doing, but it's, it, the fact is the Republican Party is dead. So in that in that instance, the politics of this become very, very different because it's how you are imagining what's going on, right? Yeah. If you are imagining this is a normal election, you know, that there was a primary in Iowa and there's a primary in New Hampshire and, you know, Nikki Haley, maybe will she have a chance? But this, <laughs> this is crazy. The race is over. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Yeah. Well, there was no race. Yeah, there was never there a race. No race. That's what I've been saying, of There's course. No race. Yeah, no this is a cult. This is a party that is not a cult. Well, it is. It has cultish aspects to it. But it is a political party that is not a normal political party that is being run by a charismatic despot. And that's what we're up against. So this is a, this is a coup d'etat that began in 2020, in June 2020, no, no later than that. And it has been continuing. It hasn't stopped. And that's what we're up against. Now, I can say that future historians will see that this way just because it's it's institutionally what's happening. So the normalization of the election is part of why I think, you know, people talk about guardrails, people talk about this. People want to assume that we're in a normal situation. We are not in a normal situation. We're in a potentially revolutionary situation. That's not an alarmist. I'm not being an alarmist. I'm certainly not being a Democrat or a liberal. This is not, this is an historical judgment. It's unlike anything we've seen before, with the possible exception of, of what happened in 1860-61. You know, I think it's time for um, Americans of goodwill, including, you know, people who think still think of themselves as Republicans, to stand up to these people the same way that Abraham Lincoln stood up to the secessionists. You know, Abraham Lincoln was was accused of being, well, he's alarmist. They're, these secessionists, they're not really going to do, you know, all of this, you know, it's not so bad. Well, no. He understood what was going on. And he stood up to them. In that case, with you know, with with real force. So, I I stand with Lincoln. We're getting a little away from Section Three, but that's all right. We'll return to it. Uh, part of what is difficult to discern here is any systematic ideological underpinning for Trumpism. There isn't one. Uh, the man does not have a coherent ideology. It's all about him. It's been called illiberal populism. I mean, that's what I've used. It doesn't really tell us what it's mm -hmm. all about. I just had a, a long conversation in one of my recent episodes with Roger Griffin, who's a terrific historian at Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom, a scholar of fascism and political movements about, you know, what is Trumpism? He's not a fascist. So what do, what do we call this? It's, it's always been my position or I shouldn't say always, but recently, that if Trump were to change his uh, views on almost every policy tomorrow, it wouldn't make any difference with his supporters. And he does change his mind. He's already kind of regretting the Roe versus Wade thing. He's squishy when it comes to policy and ideology. You know, look, to try to uh, ascribe an ideology to charismatic despotism, which is what this is, is mistaken, I think. We habitually do so. You know, we try to figure out what is that body of ideas, is he a fascist, is he not a fascist? This is irrelevant. This has now become a despotic movement. It is about one man and one man only. What would happen after that? Well, despots figure that out when, when they have to. But right now, that's what this is. And it will have tremendous institutional damage because there are plenty of people around Trump who would consolidate and, and, and formalize the revolution that he is attempting to pull off, the counter-revolution he's attempting to pull off. But right now, it's, it's, it's sheerly, as you say, it's about one man. Trump could say anything he wants. Trump could come out tomorrow in favor of whatever, good things, things we might approve of. And his followers would still follow him because it's all blind faith. So Griffin calls this 
incurvation, what he sees across the world, not just here. Trump, Putin, Xi, Orban, Erdogan, the junta in Myanmar, a Kim in mm-hmm. North Korea. Incurvation mm-hmm. is uh, curving in on yourself, rejecting the other, hostility to migrants, hostility to multiculturalism, international cooperation, international bodies and foundations. You already mentioned NATO, things like that, mm-hmm. the United mm-hmm. Nations. Now, incurvation is not and I think uh, Roger Griffin and I are the only two people who have used this word. In a sense. <laughs> but it's right, not a political right. ideology. It's just a retrenchment from liberal democracy. Well, you could say, you could put it that way, each with its own aspect to it. I mean, Putin's got his own cult of personality around him. You know, they have other things that are similar. I mean, the yeah. Christian nationalism here and the kind sure. of, you know, strange Russian orthodoxy that Putin seems to be promoting. I mean, there are many similarities. But yes, it is effectively undoing not simply the history of the world since 1945 and the building of a world structure that came out of the the Second World War to try to prevent anything like this happening again, it's now happening again everywhere. And it's succeeding everywhere, defying the institutions or the intentions, let alone the institutions, the intentions of the institutions that were created in the aftermath of World War II and out to undo everything that we tried to build. And even deeper beyond that, I mean, I think it's a, it's a reaction, as you say, against liberalism. But when we talk about liberalism, we're not just talking about the New Deal. I think it goes all the way back to the Enlightenment. And they're trying to undo the Enlightenment, some of the people that are around Trump. You know, they want to turn this place into a theocracy. And that's very real. That's what Christian nationalism is, by the way. And that's what the equivalents are in these other places. And it's trying to undo everything that defines that has defined um, modern tolerance, modern government. It's it's that deep, I think. Now, are they well thought out about this? Is there a philosopher of this? You don't have to have a philosopher of this in order to be very, very real. And that's what I fear. Is that going to happen right away? No, but is, does it run that deep? Yes, it does. It really does. So getting back to section three, Sean Wolens. Uh, yes, let's get back to the, to the real no. topic, right. No, but uh, you've got me thinking about a lot of stuff I, I could bring up, but uh, we may never finish here, uh, which is okay. But, you know, I don't do like five-hour podcasts. Uh, <laughs> right. About Section 3, because we said that, in a sense, Mm -hmm. whether Trump wants to be a saint or a villain or whatever, in one sense, is irrelevant. If you've been an insurrectionist, that's it. You don't get another shot at this. We've already covered the dispute between whether this is best dealt with as a political problem or a legal problem. There's another dispute here, too, that falls into the legal realm, and that is, what is insurrection? What was January 6th? I've been careful about calling it an insurrection, but I think what your essay in NYRB, New York Review of Books, reminded me, you just can't look at that day alone. You have to look at the months-long effort with lawsuits, extrajudicial tactics like going on television and you know riling people up about a stolen election, and January 6th itself. You have to look at the whole picture. What's insurrection? I mean, you have a definition here in your essay. You actually, I have a definition yeah. that I take largely from a legal historian at the University of Maryland named Mark Graber, who has looked into this much more deeply than, than almost anybody. And he comes up with a definition. Look, there's been a, these weird debates have been going on. What is an insurrection? You know, does an insurrection require what happened in 1861? Does an insurrection, well, there's plenty of insurrections other than that. There's in American history, there's the Whiskey Rebellion, there's the Nat Turner Rebellion. You know, those are all called insurrections at the time. So John Brown. Maybe it doesn't have to be that. John Brown, exactly. They're all called insurrections at the time. So maybe it's not that. Then you know, other people say, well, you know, no, not really. Those are not quite the same thing as happened. Look, there's a very clear originalist. You know, if you're going to go to the court, you have to go to originalist. That's what Professor Graeber has to offer, which is an originalist definition of what an insurrection is. And I commend, you know, your readers to just look at my piece or you can find Professor Graeber's stuff online. It's very clear in the 1860s what people thought of thought of an insurrection as. And it involved four different steps. And I don't I have them here. I can I'll say them. Okay, good. An assemblage of people Mm -hmm. engaged in resisting a federal law. Using Mm -hmm. force or a threat of force with intimidating numbers and with a public purpose, or in the words of Justice Samuel Chase in 1800, an object of a great public nature or of public and general concern. And I'll just add to that, and you make this point as well, is that you don't actually have to be engaged in any violence to be considered an insurrectionist. Those names I mentioned, the Southerners I mentioned at the top of our interview here, some of those guys are just office holders. They never picked up a musket. Look, and Professor Graeber is a very, very eminent constitutional scholar. He has read 
through <laughs> all of the, he's gone back to Edward III in Britain to, to come up with a, an historical and originalist rendering of what was understood as insurrection in 1860, 1866 through 68, when the, the 14th Amendment was, was framed and, and approved and ratified. And those are the elements. If you believe the consensus of what Donald Trump was up to between June 2020 and January 6, 2021, it fits. It fits an originalist definition of what insurrection amounts to. The idea that there's that that this is not what an insurrection is, this is pounding the table because the facts and the law are against them. So they're trying to find some other way to get out of all of this. I might add as well, the 14th Amendment, when it was ratified, when it was drafted rather, um, framed, particularly Section 3, was not simply referring to the Civil War, not simply referring to the Confederacy. They were very explicit that this was meant for all time. That's right. This no expiration to, date. Exactly. This is for every future rebellion, as one, as one of the senators put it. It's a warning, an advanced warning to prevent future things from happening like this. And if you've committed an insurrection once, there's no reason to think you're not going to do it again. Yeah, because prior to the ratification of the 14th Amendment, it took a while to get it through all the states. Uh, prior sure. to that, there had been pieces of legislation passed to ban people, specific people, right. whoever. But the 14th Amendment does not mention any individuals. It mentions the offices, and it stands for all time. There's no expiration date right. on the Well, some people don't think, though. So I've read, you know, you read these things. And say, well, they were just talking about the Civil War. Unless we have a Civil War, it's not this. That's just wrong. I mean, it's just simple. It's simple. Yeah, and you don't need to actually get involved in any kind of violence either to... Right. Yeah, you have to That's right. You support the insurrection. Well, I, I or, suppose, planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or planet. Yeah, or planet. Or planet. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose this is going to be what the court takes up in a couple of days. They're going to have hear these arguments, and they're going to be semantics and uh, what's the what's the term I'm looking for? Cutting, splicing, what hair splitting, it? hair splitting. There you hair go. Hair splitting. Splicing yes, right. is an audio old audio technician's word. You splice, <laughs> splice audio right. tape. So about the originalism, I, I assume Sean Wilentz, historian, that the six conservatives on the bench, if they consider themselves original would have to go along with this, but courts are political. The Congresses in the 1860s were political. I mean, you can't really remove politics from this. No, of course not. And, you know, somebody, uh, someone I won't, won't get his name, but a, a person I respect greatly, who everybody in the audience probably has heard of, uh, wrote to me saying, look, you're absolutely right. Your argument is irrefutable, but it's their candy store and they can do what they want with it. They'll find a way to do this. That's maybe true. I I don't think that this conservative majority is a block. I think that there are fissures with, within that block. First of all, let me just say first, before, before that, you have three really outstanding liberals on the court, and they're going to be making their arguments, and they're making their arguments in front of their colleagues, and they can be compelling too. Um, so let's not forget about them. I mean, they sometimes get pushed aside because they're in a the minority, but they also have a voice. This is just Princeton loyalty, but my student, Elena Kagan, is among them. But there are three very skilled people there. That's number one. But number two, I don't think that the conservative majority is on block. They have many things in common. But I do think that Justices Alito and Thomas are of a different sort than the others. My guess is, my thought is that especially Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett, whatever their judicial philosophy is, no matter who appointed any of that, that they do have a sense of history. And they do have a sense of not only the past, but of their own place in history. And I do think they will take these things seriously. I'm not sure that any of the others, well, I'm not sure that Alito and, and Thomas do. I, I don't know. But my impression is that they do. And that if you take your place in history seriously, then the compelling nature of the originalist arguments for disqualification will actually mean something. They won't be just dismissed out of hand because you have to look at that carefully. So I'm not I'm not convinced that I mean, I wouldn't have written in what I wrote if I thought it was just, you know, you know, spitting in the wind. I mean, there's no point to doing that. I think there's a possibility that something could be done. And, you know, yeah, politics is there, of yeah, course. Of course yeah. But I do think that there's a place. There are certain cases. Let's put it this way. There are certain cases where and Dred Scott was one of them, actually, where politics and the law have to be squared up one way or the other. You've reached a point of no return. You have to go one way or the other. And in 1857, Chief Justice Torney went all the way for a misreading of the Constitution, for a misreading of everything. But it, it was totally political, in my view. We're at that point now. 
And this could be as meaningful a decision as any that the court has undertaken. Especially if more so, states follow in Maine and Colorado's footsteps. And It's not just other states. I mean, they might want to put him on the ballot or something, but he is formally disqualified. He cannot run for president. Now, you know. Oh, OK. So I'm missing that. I'm missing that. And by upholding that, which is in the Colorado decision, it has a meaning beyond, you know, the state oh. by state stuff. I'm, I'm not a legal scholar here. Uh, for some reason, I thought that the Supreme Court might just say, listen, each state can decide this on their own. That might be what it comes down to, Martin. I don't want yeah. to say that it's not. But my view of the 14th Amendment, and I think that's the view of many, many other people, is that this is not even something, something has to be contested, that the Colorado court has already made that decision. Perhaps it would be state yeah. by state. But even if it is state by state, it would be devastating. Yeah, we've gone over how the amendment, 14th, is all, all of its sections. They're all self-executing. Yet here we are. We, we are in a situation where we do need someone to say what should happen here. Well, the, uh, I mean, it's gone to the Supreme Court. Yeah. I don't think the Supreme Court should have taken the Colorado case. They did, because I don't think there's any question, given the nature of the amendment, that what the Colorado court did is follow the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. There's no reason to, to hash it out at the Supreme Court level. But the Supreme Court has taken it upon itself to, to, to make this decision. I understand why they might want to do that because of the nature of the people are so uncertain and things are so chaotic that they have to establish something. But it is in the courts. You know, it's up to the courts. This is a matter of law, of constitutional law. In the old days, as you said at the, at the top of the show, Martin, the Ordinary courts, state courts, local courts actually took care of this. In New Mexico, that was a local you know, state court. That wasn't, you didn't require Congress to do it. You didn't require the Supreme Court to do it. Now, all of a sudden, this has become something that goes beyond that because it's involving a presidential election and not a county commissioner in New Mexico. Okay, I get it. And we're in a very volatile political moment. Okay, I get it. So we were in 1857. The similarities of the situations are actually becoming more apparent day by day. So that the, the court now is faced with a, a situation not unlike what the Tony court faced in 1857. We'll see how they rule. But by the way, if the Tony court has gone down in history as, you know, <laughs> in disgrace. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and well, and they are they are inviting disgrace. You take issue with how some other historians uh, who, in your view, should know better, have written about this uh, in your New York Review of Books essay. Well, I don't know. I don't know that I disagree with historians. I mean, historians, in fact, have been almost unanimous in some terms of the amicus briefs. Well, Samuel Moyne um, is a historian, but a journalist. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, he's a law. He's, he's in the law school. Genuine historians have been yeah. very, very clear. There were twenty-five people who signed an amicus brief yeah. that included, you know, the likes of Jim McPherson yeah, and read you know, that one. the greatest living authority on on the Civil War. There was another one that came out of Harvard and Yale that that my dear friend. David Blight was a part of. Drew and, you Gilpin know, Faust. If, yeah. You know, and Drew Faust and, and Jill Lepore. I mean, historians have not been equivocal about this. I don't have to criticize historians. I criticize some legal academics and um, journalists and, and pundit and pundits, yeah. pundits. And, and, you know, but pundits have a lot, you know, everybody thinks they know history. Including me. No, I'm, well, no, but you know, but no, you, know but you, you unlike many Martin, A, you do know some history and B, you talk to historians. Yes. You know, it's just something that other people don't do. They think they can figure out on their own. Well, yeah, you know, no, no one look, would listen here. to this show if I just did a forty-five minute monologue. So, I well, you know, but the, but this is the this is yeah. the importance of that. Look, I don't mean to flatter you too much, Martin, but I mean this is why it is important that you do what you do, because you know the fact is that the alienation of public debate and expertise is becoming increasingly problematic, increasingly difficult. People don't think that experts count for anything. Well, we are experts for a reason. Yeah. Um, we're not just setting ourselves up as such. I had that in mind when I launched this project three years ago. I want to yeah. allow experts to have a platform where I can then disseminate their ideas to an audience. So final final thing we'll get here, uh, Sean. Um, you touched on this already, the problems with our politics, with one of our two main political parties. Whatever happens mm -hmm. here in this case in my view, won't solve the problem. If you feel it's a problem, there might be people listening to this who like Donald Trump or subscribe to his brand of populism, maybe disliking him personally because of all of his crude and cruel comments, right? Uh, that was what DeSantis was supposed to be. The Trumpism without him uh, didn't work out well. I guess what I'm getting mm -hmm. at here is the problem 
that we're talking about here uh, will persist beyond this November. And I've done a lot of shows recently, talked to Norman Lichtenstein about changes in global capitalism and deindustrialization, NAFTA, China in the World Trade Organization, institutional failure, our forever wars, the opioid epidemic, the crash of 08. That gave Trump a constituency. And those problems, their consequences are going to stick around and other candidates on the right can exploit the legitimate grievances. Sure, but him is him yeah. makes all the difference. Yes. But he's not going to be around forever, is, though. You could do yeah. a lot of damage, believe me. I mean, Argentina was not the same after Juan Perón for a long time. You know, in other places, it took a lot to undo. No, there's a difference. And I contradicted I never, myself in that, that rambling question, but go ahead, yeah. Well, no, you didn't contradict yeah. yourself, yeah. but I think people have to draw the distinction between the likes of a Nikki Haley, who is highly conservative, Highly right wing, in my view, Ron DeSantis, who is, you know, terrible. He's awful in his politics. But they have not created a charismatic despotism. They have not created a movement like that. That's what holds Trump apart. That's why it makes all the difference that he is gone. We continue to have our arguments, we continue to have our fights. So far, I'm convinced that none of the others that we're talking about, well, with the possible exception of, of what's his name, I can never pronounce his name correctly, but, you know, the guy who's been more Trumpist than Trump out there. Ramaswamy. Clear and present, yes, he would be a clear and present danger, perhaps, because he'd like to be a charismatic despot himself. I don't think he has the chops for it, but nevertheless, that's what he's the only other one that's out there. But the rest of them are still have conventional sense of what conventional politics is. None of them, I think, would try to launch an insurrection to keep themselves in power. That's what we're up against here. That's why it's an abnormal election. The problems are going to persist. America always has problems. You know, the yeah. problems of the Civil War are still with us. We still have these. That's what America is. America is an argument over its problems. And, and the success of American democracy has been precisely that we can do that without killing each other. And, you know, we can shift power back and forth and we can let the majority rule. If Nikki Haley were the candidate of the Republican Party, I wouldn't be you know, yelling and screaming the way I am. Um, I wouldn't be as disturbed as much as I am. You know, we'd have an argument about, yeah. about what she believes or, or even DeSantis. But Trump is something else. Trump is of another order. And we have to recognize that. Yeah, he trashed the peaceful transfer of power, which is one of our most important, if not the most important tradition we have Absolutely. in our democracy. And also, Absolutely. yes, majority rule. We're premised on majority rule with uh, respect for the rights of minorities. But majority yep. rule, if you don't accept the outcome of an election, well, then you're like the guys in 1860. <laughs> Secession was about Abraham Lincoln winning an election. Correct. That's why it's similar to that, because there is a, they're, they're willing to repudiate the Constitution, basically, in order to get their way. So, yeah. So I think this is special. I think this is different. Again, I go to I look to the person who is articulating what I think better than anybody else in the political realm right now is, is Liz Cheney. She gets it. And by the way, um, most of the issues, I suspect Representative Cheney and I would be 180 degrees apart. You know, she is a conservative Republican. I'm a liberal Democrat. But there is this thing, and I'll, and I'll bring your listeners' attention to it. There is an idea, it's an old idea, but it's an important one, that there's a thing called the vital center. It's vital because it allows for disagreement. It, it is alive. It is you know, fighting like you know, tooth and nail when necessary. But it is the center because it rejects, rejects the kind of despotism. When it was first brought up, when it was first coined by an enemy, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., he was talking about it's not fascist and it's not communist. It's not the extreme right or the extreme left. The, the terms are different, you know, these days than they were then, but but we know what we're talking about, that you leave, that you move beyond what the constitutional norms are, so that the vital center um, has to pull together here, it seems to me. We have no choice but to do so. We pulled together in, during the 1940s against fascism, and then we did so in the 1950s and 60s against communism. We have to do this against Trumpism, which is as clear and present a danger, I believe, to the American democratic order as any of the other things we've talked about. It's not the same as them. It's different. It's distinct. It is Trumpism. But the vital center has to unite, has to unite against this clear and present danger, this clear and present threat. That's what Liz Cheney's talking about, and that's what I'm talking about, and that's why we're, you know, we're together on this. We're both vital centrists. Donald Trump believed he could convince his voters to buy it, whether he had any actual evidence of fraud or not. And this same thing continued to occur from election day onward until January 6th. Donald Trump was confident that he could convince his supporters the election was stolen, no matter how many lawsuits he lost, and he lost scores of them. 
He was told over and over again in immense detail that the election was not stolen. There was no evidence of widespread fraud. It didn't matter. Donald Trump was confident he could persuade his supporters to believe whatever he said, no matter how outlandish, and ultimately that they could be summoned to Washington to help him remain president for another term. And that was Liz Cheney from the January 6th committee hearing. We thank Sean Wilentz, author of The Rise of American Democracy, for returning to the show. And after the Supreme Court hands down its ruling, decides Donald Trump's fate for the 2024 ballot, I intend to do another episode analyzing that decision. We'll have audio from the February 8th oral arguments as well. On the next episode of History As It Happens, have you seen the Oscar-nominated film The Zone of Interest about the Holocaust, about the Commandant of Auschwitz? We're going to talk to a Holocaust historian about that film and the historicizing of the Holocaust as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.